Thank you. As President Trump weighs his options in Syria, we're taking a closer look at the risk of global conflict in the country. For more than or more on this, rather, we're going to bring in CBSN contributor Willis Sparks. He writes for Signal, a newsletter produced by G Zero Media. And I really like the way the newsletter is written this week. I like it every week. Thank you. But this week, you present sort of a devil's advocate argument. What foreign policy, what foreign policy advisors may be telling the president versus why what we believe the president may be leaning towards, which is a missile strike because of based on his tweets, why, you know, he might be, it might make sense for him to maybe do things opposite to what the foreign policy advisors may be suggesting. Um, and one might say, look, you did a missile strike last year after a chemical attack, doesn't look like anything changed, but you say, hey, there's another argument. I wrote a piece that, that goes beyond Syria because I feel like so much of the, the conversation about foreign policy now is just determined by whether people love Trump or hate him and that we're not really thinking about the issue. What, what are the risks and costs and opportunities created by taking military action in Syria? How long should U.S. troops be there? And we could talk about relations with Russia and trade and NAFTA and China and all of that. But on Syria, the first question is, do you take military action in response to uh, what appears to have been a chemical attack in Syria? Um, the argument in favor, of the, to me the strongest argument in favor goes beyond Syria. There is a chemical weapons ban that was signed by m almost all the countries in the world uh, you know, a generation ago. Syria signed it. This is international rule of law. Right. Who's going to enforce it? Right. So, no, you're not going to fundamentally change Syria with a military strike that's designed as retaliation for these strikes. Mm -hmm. But maybe you're sending a message to Syria and to anyone else in the world that would ever use these kind of right. weapons North Korea. that there is a price to pay. Now, right. a year ago, what President Trump did was he ordered 59 Tomahawk missiles to hit an airport runway and a few planes. And essentially, the Syrians and the Russians looked at that and said, Oh, I see. We committed murder and the, we got 15 days of community service. Not much of a deterrent. So that's part of the discussion now, too. If you're going to hit them, don't do it like you did it last year. Maybe it's not one strike. Maybe it's a series of strikes. Maybe it takes place over several weeks. Obviously, you want to choose your targets carefully. Certainly, there's huge risk here that you've got to weigh. You've got to decide how much to share with the Russians in advance. There are a lot of complicated questions right. up to and including what targets you hit. But there are options on the table, and there is an opportunity for President Trump to play some role in enforcing rule of law on the question of whether a, a, a person will be allowed to order a chemical attack on innocent men, women, and children. So, U.S. intelligence has confirmed that there uh, were four other chemical attacks, I think, in the last uh, six months or so. Right. There were no missile strikes for right. any of those attacks. Had there been, do you think we would not be having this conversation now? I, you know, it's pure conjecture, but, I mean, the, the best argument, I think, would be maybe those four strikes wouldn't have happened if the response a year ago had been much more forceful. Mm -hmm. If it hadn't been a pen, uh, a pinprick strike on a tarmac and a few planes. Can, can we do this without Russia? Last year, it, w it was Russia's responsibility to get rid of these chemical weapons or at least take them out of the hands of, yeah. of Assad. Clearly, that didn't happen. Can we do this without Russia? Well, First of all, you can't really do anything in Syria without taking the Russians into consideration because Russia has a long-term interest there. They intend to be a player over the longer term, and there's not much the U.S. can do about that unless they want to go to war with Russia, which clearly you don't. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you know, President Obama took a lot of heat, justifiably, in my opinion, by drawing a red line and then not enforcing it. But the other mistake beyond not enforcing the red line was taking Russia's word that they were going to guarantee the removal of chemical weapons that the Syrian government did not even admit they had. Mm -hmm. So don't assume that Russia is going to play a constructive role here. You're going to have the Security Council meeting, and the Russians are going to accuse the U.S. or, or Syrian groups or someone else of actually staging this attack. Mm -hmm out of, you know, the desire to drive anger at Russia, this is not going to be a pretty picture in, in New York at the U.N. Security Council today. <laughs> so you've got to deal with Russia, but the idea that they're going to help you yeah. in some way 
It, don't see that happening, certainly Does not Does that also mean that the U.N. Security Council isn't going to be able to do much either? No, the Security Council is not going to be able to do right. much because the U.S. and Russia both have vetoes, and their, their interests and their outlook here are diametrically opposed. It's just example number 7,343 of Indeed. the ways in which Security Council vetoes make it impossible for the U.N. to do certain things. Yeah. Okay, let's hit hard numbers uh, before you go uh, on this topic. 44. Yeah, 44 Syrian refugees have been admitted to the United States in the first three months of this year, compared with more than 12,000 in 2016 and more than 6,000 last year. So there are people who are saying, look, President Trump, if you really care about Syrian civilians, maybe we should be admitting more of them into the United States. It's 